Thank you, James, for putting that video together and giving us that update. Uh, I would just add that 100% um, of the mission's budget is supported through your designated giving to missions. Uh, and so it's not funded through our general fund. Um, and, uh, and so we would encourage you all to give generously to missions. Uh, you can designate missions from the drop-down box in any of the giving formats or write missions on the memo of your check, and that will support, uh, support that ministry. Well, this is the uh, fourth week of our vision campaign. Uh, we're calling the vision campaign Sowing in Grace. Um, we have celebrated 25 years of God's faithfulness to this church, and, and uh, it's a good pivot point to look ahead to the coming years, perhaps the, the coming 25 years, as, as we seek to increasingly give ourselves away. That's really what is motivating this vision campaign. Last week, we looked at our calling as a church to make disciples, and we saw that a disciple is someone that Jesus calls to be with them in relationship together with God's people so that he can send us out to join him in his mission in the world. And uh, our passage last week showed how Jesus selected the 12, the initial disciples, and, uh, and the purpose that he had for them. Our passage today is Matthew uh, chapter 9, verses 35 through chapter 10, verse 5. And this passage builds on last's, last week's sermon by showing how Jesus then commissioned those disciples and actually sent them out on their first mission trip, if you will. Uh, and so please turn there if you have a Bible. Uh, if you don't, you can grab one of the blue Bibles under the chairs uh, underneath you. Um, in the blue Bible, you'll find that on page 790, Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35, once I get there. And if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 9, 35 through chapter 10, verse 5. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. And we'll leave it at there for today, because those instructions are a whole chapter for another time. So uh, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would teach us from it. Lord, might we get a glimpse of your heart, your character, and uh, Lord, would your spirit work in our lives to make us more like you, uh, that we would share your character and your heart, your love for people. And Father, speak to us and equip us and encourage us and stir our imagination for what it could look like to be a part of your harvest field. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, this passage begins with Jesus revealing something of his motivation for ministry. And uh, Jesus' motivation for ministry ought to inform our motivation for ministry as we follow him. And so um, we want to learn from him. And that motivation is based on something that we need to see and feel. See and feel. Verse 35 is a summary statement of Jesus' public ministry in general. It just kind of talks about what he has been doing as he's going to all these towns and villages. And then verse 36 adds something to that. It gives us a glimpse, really the first time in Matthew's gospel this is explicitly mentioned. It gives us a glimpse of his heart. Um, we, we get to see what he's thinking as he's going through all these towns and villages throughout Galilee 
And Jesus sees something that most of us don't see. As he traveled around, as he observed people in these various towns that he came to, he noticed something about them. The text says that uh, he saw that they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And so despite the people probably going about their normal, everyday routines, Jesus sees beneath the surface. Certainly some of them were poor, some of them were sick, some of them were especially needy in various ways. Uh, Jesus provides healing for those folks. Uh, but Jesus is describing the crowds as a whole. He's, he's talking about people in general. All of them were harassed and helpless because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now in the Old Testament, this idea of a shepherd, obviously it was used of God himself, but it was often used of the people's leaders. Uh, the leaders of the people would shepherd the people. And uh, as Jesus considers the people as Without a shepherd, you could certainly say that their political and spiritual leaders had failed them, right? They were conquered by the Romans. The scribes and the Pharisees placed these heavy religious legalistic burdens on them. But I think there's more going on here than just failed leadership. Certainly part of it, but not even close to the substance of it. Their distress goes deeper than that. Jesus sees their spiritual condition. And the ordinary people of Israel in Jesus' day were lost sheep, he calls them, awaiting the messianic shepherd that God had promised to bring to them, the one who would take away their sin, the one who would restore the kingdom of God. And the scriptures are clear that that doesn't just apply to first century Jews in Jesus' day, but that same condition applies to everyone. So, for example, among many passages we could look at, Ephesians 2 describes the natural spiritual condition every one of us has. And, and it, it may sound harsh when we read it, but it's like a doctor's diagnosis of a terminal illness. We need to hear it in order to be open to the solution. Ephesians 2 describes our natural spiritual condition as dead in our sins. Spiritually dead, separated from God, following the ways of the world and of the devil, deserving God's wrath. People without Christ are like sheep without a shepherd. Now think of that image. Uh, there may not be a domesticated animal more, de uh, more dependent and therefore more helpless than when it's left on its own than a sheep. No natural defenses, where sheep are helpless to, de to protect themselves against predators. Um, they're not the smartest animals on the planet. They soon run out of pasture and starve. They're prone to get lost or caught in some thicket and die. In the meantime, harassed, wearied, helpless if they're left on their own. And Jesus says, this is our condition. Uh, and he says that not in a judgmental way, but as we see here, in a compassionate way, because he wants to meet us in our spiritual need. And so as we think about this, not, uh, the unbelievers that you know may not seem to fit that description. You may not necessarily think that description applies to you. But if Ephesians 2 and the rest of the Bible is true, and we believe it is, then that's a fitting description of all people who find themselves separated from a relationship with God. It's a fitting description of all the people without Christ all around us. Jesus sees our true spiritual need. Sometimes that's more obvious. Sometimes it's hidden under this veneer of self-assurance or self-reliance. But he doesn't just see their need. He doesn't see our need he also feels compassion towards us, the text says. Um, there's this deep gut-level reaction to what he sees is our condition, our need, our, our desperate need. He takes our condition to heart. And so the sorrows of the people are Christ's own sorrows because he cares for us. He loves us. 
His compassion is what motivates and fuels his ceaseless ministry activity that we read about in the, in the Gospels to minister to us. His compassion is what makes him eager to help us. Think about the last time you felt compassion, like a strong pity for someone. Now, I remember when one of my children, it's a long time ago now, when one of my children was born prematurely and had to be admitted into the NICU, right? He couldn't eat and so was being fed through a feeding tube, wires connected to him, he's hungry, he couldn't possibly understand what was going on, and we had to leave him at the end of the day, every day, for weeks until we were eventually able to take him home. It was a pitiful condition. Perhaps there's a child that you know and love who has cancer or who's going through a hard time. It just doesn't seem right that someone so young would have to go through something like that. Perhaps you're moved by footage of news stories of people suffering through war. Whatever it may be, think of a time when you have been moved for compassion for someone. Can you think of something? Jesus feels that kind of compassion, at least even more so for every one of us. He calls his disciples, he calls us to see people's underlying spiritual need and to feel compassion for them as well. And the truth is that none of us just is naturally oriented that way. Some of us are more compassionate people than others, but you know, we care about some people, sure. But do we care about the crowds that way? All of our unbelieving neighbors and colleagues and classmates, the people that we see passing by every day, we don't even know who they are. Do we have that sense that they need Christ, that they're separated from God, perhaps? That may be one of our greatest needs as Jesus' disciples. Right? Our need is to share his heart. Our need is to feel compassion because of their need. Our need is to have more of the vision and the heart of Jesus so that we care and we love more like Jesus cared and loved. And so what do you do if you're just not feeling it? Right? What do you do when you recognize, yeah, I don't think of people that way. I don't have a heart for people in that way. Well, we do what we always do when we recognize there's a gap in our lives. Right? We confess our sin. We confess our lack of compassion in this case. Right? God, forgive me. Um, uh, I don't care about people nearly as much as you do. And so, Lord, cleanse my heart. We preach the gospel to ourselves. The good news is that Jesus has compassion on us. We were those sheep, and he loves us anyway. His compassion that he has for the people described in this passage, he has for us as well. He forgives us. He spiritually feeds us and defends us, protects us. Though we were lost sheep, he has become our good shepherd. And as we grow in our experience of his grace and his mercy for us, the Holy Spirit can grow this kind of compassion in us for other people as well as by his grace, we become more like him over time. And in light of the gospel, we pray we seek to, to live as compassionate people as best we can, mindful of the spiritual condition around us, willing to go to them like Jesus came to us. We're all in process on this, but this is the kind of character that God is working to build in our lives as disciples. And so because Jesus sees our need and feels compassion for us, we need to see and feel uh, for those who don't know Christ around us and throughout the world. So first, this passage teaches us uh, to see and to feel. Second, it teaches us to recognize and pray. Recognize not only the need around us, but also the opportunity. Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful. And so the metaphor changes in verse 37. Unbelievers are not only like sheep who are in trouble, they're also like wheat that can be harvested, that can be brought into God's, God's barn, if you will. And so if we need the eyes of Jesus to see the lostness of people and the heart of Jesus to feel compassion for them, we also need the expectation of Jesus for anticipation of the harvest, 
right, for the harvest that will be brought in, everyone around you is a potential saint. Right? God can work in all of our lives. The harvest is truly plentiful. And the size of the harvest increases the urgency. I mean, imagine this massive, ripe harvest that's out there. There's a sense of urgency to go and bring it in before the crops die in the field. And friends, the harvest is only getting larger. Do you realize that? The Lausanne movement recently published the State of the Great Commission report they had over 170 contributors from every region of the world. And part of this report showed that if current trends continue for the next 25 years, despite the previous century where we saw increasing access to the gospel from people all around the world, um, by contrast, with the exception of Africa, in the next 25 years, every region of the world, including our own, will witness an increase of the proportion of the population who has never heard the gospel. Did you catch, did you catch that? That was a complicated sentence, right? <laughs> um, the unchurched population is growing faster than the number of people exposed to the gospel. Um, every year that goes by, more people will have not ever heard than we're reaching. The most significant spiritual trend in Western nations, including our own, is the explosion of the number of people who identify as religiously unaffiliated. Sometimes they're called the nuns, the people who check none on their religious affiliation on census information and surveys. And this change corresponds to pretty much an equivalent decrease in the number of people who are identifying as Christian. Right? The harvest is plentiful. Despite significant fruit that God is producing here and around the world, the harvest is only getting bigger. And so compared to the massive harvest field, Jesus stressed that the laborers are few. We desperately need more laborers in our own harvest field. God is accomplishing his purposes. We, we can be confident of that. But the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And so we need to continue to, to work here at GRC to create a culture of discipleship that seeks to mature and equip every one of us to live as an ambassador of Christ wherever we live, work, and play. Right? So that we're able to share the gospel with those that God has put in our lives that we have access to, that we care about. We also need to raise up our own future pastors and church planters and missionaries. Uh, the reality is it's taking longer and longer to fill church positions, pastoral positions or, or staff positions, especially in our, in our region. It took several years to, to, to fill my position. It took over a year to fill Drew's. We've been looking for a church planter for over five years and GRC is not alone in this, right? These are consistent with trends in our presbytery as well. And so what we're realizing, it should be obvious, I guess, but it's, it's becoming more, uh, more, more apparent to us, is that we cannot rely on just recruiting people from outside the region to move here to do ministry amongst us. Future pastors and church planners are not going to knock on our door to come here. Biblical counselors are not waiting for a job offer from us. We need to raise up our own future leaders for the church and for the world. But we also recognize that we need to think beyond our own church, beyond our own communities where our people live. Tim Keller argued that continual church planting is the only way to guarantee an increase in the number of believers in a society, a percentage of the believers in a society. That may sound odd to you, church planting. We have a lot of churches. Why, why do we need to plant more? But he pointed out that new churches are more effective at reaching new generations. They're more effective at reaching new residents in the community and new people groups that have moved into an area. Church plants have a significantly higher percentage of their members who have come to faith in Christ through the ministry of that church compared to more established churches. And history has shown that the only way throughout American history, for sure, world history, to reverse the decline of overall church attendance in a community is to increase the number of churches per 1,000 people in the, 
in, in, the, in the population. It, it, it just simply doesn't happen by hoping that more people come into existing churches. We have to always be planting churches. This is an even greater need among unreached people groups. We've talked about unreached people groups before. These are people who have virtually no access to the gospel. They don't know anyone from their culture who follows Jesus uh, for the most part. And even though unreached people groups comprise 40% of the world's population, only 3% of international missionaries go to unreached people groups. 40% of the world, only 3% of missionaries go there. The rest of the missionaries go to places where the church is more firmly established. And so the PCA, our denomination, has set a goal to raise up a thousand new missionaries to go to primarily unreached people groups in the next decade. That's a lofty goal, but it can only happen if churches like GRC raise up from amongst ourselves missionaries to go to the unreached. What do we do in the face of this overwhelming harvest field? It's not any more overwhelming to us than it was to the 12. The first thing Jesus tells his disciples to do in response to this harvest field is to pray. He says in verse 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 38, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus calls the Father the Lord of the harvest. It's his field. He's the creator. He's the owner. He's the supreme ruler over the world, over the harvest. He will accomplish his purposes. He will bring in his people. Jesus says, I have other sheep who are not of this fold. I must go get them. They'll hear my voice and follow me. But only God can produce this fruit. Only God can change people's hearts. The harvest is impossible, humanly speaking. The potential lies all with God, right? It's God's mission. Only he can raise up laborers. Only he can change our hearts so that we have compassion and a desire to engage in the task. John Piper pointed out that God has willed that his miraculous work of harvesting be preceded by prayer. God has willed that what he does, his miraculous work of harvesting, is preceded by prayer. He loves to bless the world. But even more, he loves to, an to bless the world in answer to prayer. And when we study the great revivals of history, we see that God pours out a spirit of prayer on his people before he does a great work. And so, friends, we, we can't expect to produce a spiritual harvest through in and through us if there's not a widespread movement of prayer among us. But if God moves us to pray fervently for his kingdom to advance in our lives and around the world, we have every reason to expect that God will answer his prayers, to, to bring in his harvest through the people that he sends into his harvest field. He's committed to doing that very thing. And so would you join us as a people of prayer, a praying people? You, you could join us at our, at our next kingdom prayer night. It's a day of fasting and prayer on October 25. And the details are in the app, they're on the website. But beyond this one day, this one night, will you commit to consistently praying for the harvest? That's what Jesus calls his disciples to do here, to pray, to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. Consistently pray for the harvest among the people that God has placed in your own life who don't know Jesus. Consistently pray for the harvest for our missionaries, for our own vision as a church to sow seeds of grace as we seek to find ways to give ourselves away to our community and to the world. Jesus teaches us of our need to see the lost, of our need to feel compassion for them. He calls us to recognize the harvest and pray for God to send harvesters, and this naturally leads us to the idea of send and go, send and go. 
After calling the 12 to pray at the end of chapter 9, Jesus sends them as the initial answer to their own prayers at the end of chapter 9. In chapter 10, verse 1, he summons them to him and he gives them his authority for mission. That's remarkable. Um, the specifics of their ministry may have been unique to them. They're, they're the foundation of the church. But Jesus promises us this same essential idea. He promises to give us authority uh, and, and to send us out. For example, in the same gospel, the very last scene in the gospel of Matthew uh, describes Jesus meeting with his disciples after his resurrection. And we read in chapter 28, in verse 18, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? Same thing. All authority. Jesus has been ministering throughout the early chapters of Matthew, demonstrating his authority. Well, he's even more so as the resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords. And he comes to his disciples after his resurrection and says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then he says this, Surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. To the very end of the age. His vision, his promise extended beyond the 11 at this point to all of those disciples that they would make and disciples that they would make and disciples that they would make until the end of the age. And so Jesus begins by reassuring them that as the risen Lord, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And that authority is behind his sending. That authority guarantees its success. It's the basis of our sending. And so why should we look for opportunities to share the gospel when social norms would insist that we just keep it to ourselves? Why do we insist on making disciples of all nations when society demands that we just accept every choice, every spirituality as equally valid? Why do we do these things? Because... Because the one with all authority in heaven and on earth has commissioned us to do it. Jesus ends this great commission by promising to be with us to the very end of the age. He has all authority. He is with us. He is empowering us. He is encouraging us. It is as the king of kings that Jesus sends us into the world as his ambassadors. Do you want to experience Jesus in his presence and power in your life? Then join him in his kingdom mission. Back in Matthew chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus calls his disciples, he calls them apostles in this text. And uh, it's interesting, Paul and Luke in his gospel um, uses this term to refer to an office, to refer to the 12, these people that have unique authority, divine authority. They, they're the foundation of the church. But the other gospels, including Matthew here, don't necessarily use this word as an office. Um, they only use it in the context of mission. It's, a, it's another meaning of the word. The word apostle literally means one who is sent. Right? A messenger. It's a missionary. It is the same root word as the word sent uh, in verse 5 that he uses when he says he sent them out on their mission. And as I mentioned last week, our disciple-making efforts seek to help make disciples who live up, in, and out. Right? That's, that is to grow in our relationship with God together with his people as we join in God's mission where we live, work, and play. And as each one of us is equipped and nurtured as a disciple of Jesus, that will result in raising up laborers for the harvest field. That's what every disciple is called to do. We'll seek to find ways to pray for people, for the lost. We'll, we'll seek to find ways to build bridges with them, to spend time with lost people because we care about them and and uh, God has put them in our lives. We'll ask God to open up a door of opportunity that we might encourage them with biblical truth, to share the gospel, share our testimony, share, share uh, some perspective on some issue of life. And so that's just part of what we want our disciple-making culture to produce. 
But we're also encouraged by the laborers for the harvest field that God has raised up from GRC to go to other places as well. You know, we just had an encouraging update. We saw da- uh, Daniel and Kate, right? Uh, we're, we're encouraged and grateful that God has raised them up to go to an unreached people group in the Middle East. Uh, he's raised up Cheryl this year to go to a different unreached people group. Uh, He's used GRC to help form the Kurdistan Partnership to catalyze church planting among two people groups that are unengaged with the gospel. They have had virtually no missionaries throughout their entire history for thousands of years. And we get a part of raising up the first team to go to them. We're encouraged that God has raised up the Huang family from GRC to pastor a church plant in California. And so God is working through GRC. God is working through us God is working through the people that we send. We've already been giving ourselves away for the wider kingdom beyond our own community, but we're trusting God for even more. The future now portion of our vision campaign goals seeks to cultivate a pipeline for future pastors and church planters and missionaries so that the church both here in Jersey as well as around the world can continue to send workers out into the harvest field for the cause of Christ. And that ties directly to our fourth core value. I, I, I mentioned this last week. It's a value of kingdom reproduction where we seek to develop leaders and plant churches and participate in cross-cultural and global missions. We want to find ways to recruit and develop and assess and place pastors, church planners, missionaries, other church staff, students, middle school, high school students. This ought to be on your radar. Who knows where God will call you, but you ought to at least consider if he's calling you to vocational ministry as a pastor, as a missionary. Have you ever thought about that? Is it on the table as something that you would even consider? We're developing internship opportunities for high school and for college students to help them discern if God might be calling them in this way and to help equip them in that process. We're hoping to form cohorts of seminary students uh, with other churches in our region to help mentor and equip and place, mobilize future church leaders and missionaries. Perhaps you're sitting here and God might call you to a second career. It's a vocational ministry. However God may call you personally, whatever that calling looks like for your life, he calls us collectively, his church, to equip people and to send laborers into the harvest field even as each one of us works in our particular plot of the field. Matthew 9 and 10 shows us how Jesus commissioned his disciples to do the very same ministry he himself was doing. He sends them out as messengers of the kingdom. He calls us to do the same. But to be effective and willing messengers, we need to see people's spiritual need. We need to feel compassion for them in that condition. We need to recognize that the harvest field is plentiful, that there's an incredible opportunity, but we need to pray that God would work in that harvest field, that he would raise up workers for it. And we need to send others to the various corners of that field, even as we find our own place in it. So will you help us together increasingly give ourselves away as a church as we seek to sow grace in these ways? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you meet us where we are. We ourselves We're lost sheep, but we were your sheep, and you found us. Father, even leave the 99 to go find the one. Give us that same heart. Give us that same vision for people, that same compassion for them. Stir in our hearts a deep sense of the lostness of the lost as well as the opportunity that is there for them to know you through the gospel. Father, use us in the harvest field. Raise up from among us additional laborers for the field elsewhere. Father, work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name.